host of the Coaching Matters Group Coaching Program, sponsored by Fundraising University, and super excited for today's guest, Coach Mike Bianco. He's the head baseball coach of the University of Mississippi Rebels, the 2022 NCAA Baseball National Champion. Super excited to have Coach Bianco today talk with us about building a program of excellence. But first, I want to just take a minute to welcome everyone to the Coaching Matters Group Coaching Program, sponsored by Fundraising University, and remind you that Fundraising University is the top high school fundraising company in the United States, helping to raise over $150 million for sports programs since its inception in 2009. And as former athletes and current coaches, you understand the pain points that come with having to fund your sports program. And Fundraising University provides that solution and support to help you dream big and raise more. So we want to say thank you to any current Fundraising University coaches or administrators who are on the call today and especially Justin Comrade, who's coming in from Lewis Central High School football. Let's take a look at a quick little note from Justin, and we'll get started here today with Coach Mike Bianco. Hi, this is Justin Camrad, Lewis Central High School football coach, working with Fundraising University, um, helping us raise funds for our, our football program, helping us uh, get to the next level within our program. And if you haven't been teaming with these guys, they do an outstanding job helping you guys raise the money to be able to provide for your kids and provide for your program. So we'll continue working with them um, as long as they keep working with us and, and look forward to the future with them. So thank you, Justin, for that quick message. And thank you, Mike Bahoon, for being our primary sponsor here with the Coaching Matters program. Coach Mike Bianco, head baseball coach, University of Mississippi. You've already mentioned 2022 NCAA national champion, friend and mentor of mine, someone who I've got to know in 2009, I think it was Coach B when we started this going, probably actually the fall of 2008. So, man, thank you for taking time out of your hectic schedule. He just keynoted the National Baseball Coaches Convention uh, on Friday. They're getting started with their season here pretty soon. Thanks for taking time, Coach B, to join us here on Coaching Matters. My, my pleasure, Brian. Yeah, and a uh, yeah, busy weekend, obviously, in Nashville. And, you know, it's always, I think, a, a great way to start the, the year and, uh, you know, a lot of energy, you know, uh, and it continues to grow. I mean, nearly 8,000 coaches, they said it was the largest group they've had, you know, ever. And uh, so, you know, a lot of, lot of fun to be around. And we've always thought that that's kind of the, you know, hey, when you go to the convention, you start to see all those friendly faces, uh, you know, it's the start of baseball season. So it's, uh, it's you know, what like Matt Noon said, the vice president uh, this year that, you know, runs the the convention, you know, it, it's, it's what's good about baseball. You know, we, a lot of times we can look at, you know, the different things that we need to improve on from scholarships to paid coaches and all of that. But when you put 8,000 coaches in, in one hotel, uh, it's what's good about baseball. You know, and what's great about baseball and different than any other sport, which is if you are the division one college baseball national champion, you as the head coach are the keynote speaker, the guy that kicks off the coaches national convention. So imagine Ole Miss, you're dogpiling in Omaha at the end of June. And I can imagine before you even got back to Oxford, which by the time you got back to Oxford, you were packing a bag because you were the manager of the team USA college national team this summer. So you probably had less than 48 hours left to dig into that before you had to go join the best players in college baseball. Uh, but you knew you were going to be speaking at the at the ABCA because that's kind of the rite of passage that you get when you win the national championship. So I want to go back, Coach, if we could, to that 22 season because it was truly magical. You guys are at one point during the season, I believe the number one ranked team in the country, hit a little bit of a skid, fall out of the rankings, and are conceivably the last team into the NCAA tournament, 64 out of 64, and you win the national championship. Talk about that amazing 2022 run, if you would. It, it really was, Brian. And, uh, you know, basically that was our talk. You know, the 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 mantra of the season last year was enjoy the ride, the good and the bad. We had a, an older group, a uh, veteran group that I don't think we survived, you know, last year's season without that. Some great leadership. Um, but we started off the season uh, ranked in the top five in just about every poll, got to a 9-0 and start. By the time conference rolled around uh, mid-March, we were 16-2 and and ranked number one in the country, beat a very good Auburn team on the road uh, to remain number one, and then we got beat up by uh, you know, arguably the best team in the country, Tennessee, and it kind of set us into a tailspin. And for about six weeks, we lost five of the next six weekends uh, to, to move to seven and 14 in the Southeastern Conference, uh, which is almost a kiss, kiss of death with three weeks remaining. We almost had to be perfect to, to get back to, to 500 with a chance to get the postseason. Uh, we were almost perfect. We went eight and one and uh, got close at 14 and 16, but even at that 
point. We weren't really sure because um, uh, we know, and I think you know, Brian, and, and some of the people that follow college baseball, that at 15 and 15 in Southeastern Conference, because of power ranking, because of RPI, you're probably in the NCAA tournament. Anything less than that's kind of a coin flip. And a lot of times it's not a good coin flip. It's, it might be a little less than 50%. And, and uh, so we didn't feel great uh, but on selection day, but we got in and it almost, you know, uh, I think from a, from a mental side, uh, it was so helpful because we were a good team. We were a team that played really well at the end and wasn't enough. And it got us into the tournament. But once we got to postseason, um, you know, you, you hear so much from the mental side, right? Control what you can control. All we had to do is take care of our business. All we had to do is win our games for so long because we dug such a hole for ourselves. You know, not only did we have to win our games, but we needed help from the other side. We needed teams to to lose so we could move up or move up faster. So, you know, it was amazing. It was almost, you know, one of those mental bricks taken off of us that once, you know, we got in, we just had to control our, you know, worry about ourselves. You know, we didn't have to worry about, you know, what was happening in other regionals anything else just play our game play good baseball and we did i want to go back to that selection day right i think if, as as coaches who are on the call they see the selection show you know maybe not so much the college baseball but if you think about the college basketball the baseball follows a sure. similar one right and what was it like you and your team where were you because because there had to be some pins and needles of going are we no going to get into this thing right you don't know and and then what's it like in that room when you guys get get that invitation to go well, we lose opening day, the SEC tournament. So we drive back and now we're going to have to wait five days. If we would have won a game or two, I think we would have been a shoe in to get in because of the our RPI. We still had an RPI in the mid thirties, but because of the sub 500 record, you know, it's a way for the, you know, people on the committee, if they wanted to just put, you know, that negative in, uh, you know, on, uh, on Ole Miss. And so um, we practice, we, you know, I challenged the guys. I told them, I said, Hey, listen, I don't know if we're in or not. Uh, I think we're good enough to be in. Uh, but, um, you know, one thing that I do know is we'll never forgive ourselves if our name is selected on Memorial Day and we're not we're not ready. We didn't prepare. So we practice in inner squad the rest of the week. But you're right. Walking into that room, we're in our dugout club here, uh, you know, a, a lounge for you know uh, our premium seat holders, you know, in our stadium. And we watch it. We watch it. We usually watch it without media. And, and you know, that way the kids can kind of relax and not be, you know, uh, you know, uh, everything that they do be under a microscope and let them you know have their true emotions now our our media people are there and so but it's safe because if there's something if we don't get in or something bad you know that's not going to get out there um I've been here, I've been in that meeting room on Memorial Day 21 times, right? You know, 21, you know, because uh, this was my 22nd year, but no no meeting in COVID, right? So there's no postseason. So in the 21 previous times of sitting in that room, we've gotten in 18 times. There's three times that we didn't get in and our conference record was the same 14 and 16, oh. 14 and 16, and 13 and 17. And so, um, you know, a lot of pins and needles. And But I will say this, you know, it was so genuine, uh, the the excitement from the kids, you know, once we got in, you could see it in them. They were, you know, so, so relieved, but so excited. Um, and, you know, uh, again, I think that's, we kind of needed that to kind of get back to, to, to level playing ground again. Yeah. And then, and then when you watch the postseason, I mean, you saw on display the culture that you have created there of Reds, you know, and it's something that uh, I wanted to kind of to come, come to our next question and kind of shift this from the national championship team into the culture of that national championship team. And really the culture coach B of the program that you have built at Old Miss talk to us about Rebs and where that came from and kind of what that, what that means for you in the program. Well, you know, when I first got here, you know, 23 years ago now, uh, you know, we had a great system, a system that, you know, some of your listeners may know that, you know, I was an assistant and I also played for the legendary Skip Burtman at LSU. And and uh, one of the great things about, you know, Burtman's system, um, he'd always talk about, you know, it's more than just hitting, it's more than pitching, you know, it's it's everything. It's a, it's a coffee hot in the concession stand, you know, how's our strength and conditioning program. And so I try to tell a lot of people that you he was showing motivational videos in the 80s, right? 1980s, right? He, Ken, the great uh, Ken Revisa came and spoke to our team in 1995 and 1996. So Skip Burtman was talking about the process 28 years ago, 
right? And, uh, you know, well before anybody even knew who Nick Saban was. I mean, so this was a guy that was kind of before his time. And, uh, and so when I got to Ole Miss, I had a blueprint. But one of the great things about the system is the system evolves, you know, and, you know, even though that we're still at Ole Miss running bunt defenses, the same bunt defenses that we ran at LSU in 1988, you know, things change. Analytics in baseball, right? You know, technology helps us along the way that we start to develop different ways and better ways of, you know, I think uh, completing our tasks and then being able to be better coaches, better teachers, and so on. And so, you know, I was always interested in the mental game, but never knew, you know, where do we take that next step? Well, in steps Brian Kane. Right. And so uh, I remember reaching out to Tim Corbin. I remember reaching out to Jim Schlossnagel, who at the time was at TCU. And, uh, you know, they kept talking about this guy, Brian Kane, who studied under Ken Revisa, you know, at Cal State Fullerton, and how he had a unique approach where, you know, his youthfulness, his energy was kind of captivating to the to, to the college baseball players, the, the 18 to 22 year old, you know, uh, uh, generation. And so uh, we brought you in, as you mentioned earlier, 2000 I think it was maybe December 2008 um, but I remember when uh, before you got there and again I, I'm very guarded I uh, wasn't really sure and we, we had met and we had talked about you know, hey what are you what are you going to do what are you because I you know I didn't want Brian Kane I didn't know who Brian Kane was I got a couple good recommendations but I didn't want him to come in and screw everything up we had a pretty <laughs> good thing going and uh, and you you explained it and I loved your energy uh, but it was unique. You said, Hey, I'm, I'm going to send them some stuff and I need, need your help. I need, need it to kind of be interactive. I'm going to send you some, some questions. I want the guys to fill out. And, uh, you sent them, uh, basically four different things. One, it was, what does an Ole Miss baseball player look like in practice? What does an Ole Miss baseball player look like on campus? What does it in the classroom? What does an Ole Miss baseball player look like in a community? What does an Ole Miss baseball player look like in the game? And, um, and you had that, those guys answer those questions. And as you sat down and kind of went through all the answers, they actually came up with the, the core covenants, you know, the, you know, the, the culture, if you will, of the team. And it was, you know, that's why I think it was easy to buy in because these were the words, these were the definitions that, you know, they gave to them that, it, you know, the words that kept coming up were belief selfless, excellence, relentless. And so, uh, and some of them obviously are synonyms of each other, you know, uh, you know, never, ne never say die, you know, might be the same as relentless. And so you, you yourself came up with the acronym of reps, you know, relentless, excellence, belief, and selfless. Uh, and then we try to put a definition that we all could kind of, you know, agree upon where relentless was, uh, being able to handle the adversity, you know, every single day. Uh, excellence was being at your best, you know, every single day. Belief was believing that we could succeed in every situation and selfless we over me. Um, and so uh, it's one of those things where I think a lot of people, you know, have those things or put it up on their wall and, and hey, yeah, we're, we're an excellent team or we're a selfless team. But when you make it your core covenants, when it's part of who you are as a program, I think as a coach, it's much easier to be able to to one of my favorite quotes, as you know, is repetition is the mother of skill. It's it's easy to repeat it. It's easy to keep pounding it into their heads. And so even though they don't know that. This is the answer to the question. If you went up to Peyton Chatney, if you went up to Jacob Gonzalez or TJ McCants, and you said, hey, tell me what it is to be an Ole Miss baseball player, they their answer would be reps 100%. Like they wouldn't say, well, you know, they're, they wouldn't even stutter. They wouldn't hesitate. And then that's why having core covenants, that's why uh, a way to guide your culture is so, so important to be able to write it down, to be able to put it in words where, where it matched up with our, our system was – when we teach pitching and we teach a drill, we don't teach just teach how to do the drill. We teach why we do the drill and we give them definitions and we make the players learn the exact definition verbatim. And the reason for it is it's not enough to just say, well, oh, that's what I meant. Nah, that's too vague. You know, we should be able to have, be precise. If this is really who we are, if this is defining what we are as a program, they should they should be able to say the same words. It doesn't matter if you're talking to a senior or you're talking to a, a freshman. Mm. 
Yeah. You know, and I, I love coach what you're talking about, but there's a, there's a, you know, a phraseology or a language that is spoken inside the walls of the program. Right. And as in, you know, as, as Rebs was created, this is what's been really cool. You know, as Rebs is created back in, in 2000, I think in nine, and I think it was actually January of 2009 when we first came to campus. Cause I remember we met at the ABCA with your staff and then I, think I out think, in California. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're, and, and it was like, Hey, what are we, what are we, what are we going to do? And then, right. you know, came in, came in and executed on that. Um, but what are some things now? I mean, here we are, here we are, my math, 13 years later. Yeah. And you're still working Rebs and you 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 won the national championship. You got the greatest atmosphere in college baseball, you know, one of, if not the, um, you know, what, what, how do you continue to establish and install Rebs every year? Because they're not words on a wall. You see right. your team play that way. When you listen to the post-game interviews in Omaha, you hear your team using those words, right? Talking about relentless and, and excellence and a belief and being selfless and putting we over me. What are some things that you do, Coach B, that you feel like the high school coaches that are on this call as, as, as a part of the, the, the fundraising university network, what could they do in their programs to help establish culture, like maybe drills or things that you do to build your culture around reps? Well, I think a, a couple things, but, you know, it's got to be part of your system, right? It can't just, you know, one of the things that that bothers me as a coach is, um, you know, that you're going to pick up something, what, regardless, you know, changing subjects here. Maybe it's not the mental game. Maybe it's, uh, hey, we're going to be better with getting runners in with less than two outs. And this is a typical coach mistake, right? Okay, hey, listen, we're going to motivate the guys. We're going to talk to them about getting runners in from third base and less than two outs. And when they don't do it, we're going to have them run two super poles. And, oh, okay. Okay, fine. That's that's great. But then three weeks later, they're not doing that anymore. Hey, we're going to chart, you know, every you know bad pitch, and in two or three weeks we get tired, or you know, the, the players can see that you're not invested as a staff in it. And so I think one of the things is you got to kind of figure out what's important in your program. So if the mental game is important to your program, it should be something that's in the forefront, just like batting practice, just like a, a bullpen. You know, how are we attacking the mental game? And so as you know, Brian, we we meet as a uh, uh, a team every Friday. And right, why Friday? You know, on a college campus, Fridays are great because there's no tutors, there's no tests the next day. And so after practice, after they eat, they come back to the, the meeting room and we have a team meeting every Friday for about an hour. This is throughout the fall and until we start playing games in the spring. And um, there's a segment of that about 10 or 15 minutes every Friday that touches the mental game. And it, and it always has. And so, again, you have to make time for it as a coach. You can't just rely that can't just give them a book and assume because some of them are going to read it. Most of them aren't. Hmm. And uh, and, you know, they'll try to you know, like they do in school. They'll try to, you know, skim it or they'll try to get through it. But what they're, they're going to figure out from you. One of my favorite quotes is is I can I can get them to do anything. I just can't get them to do everything. Right. And so as a program, as a coach, as a leader, I think you have to kind of direct them that these these are the tenets of our program or our system. These are the things that are important to me. You know, I get there's a lot of different things out there. Hey, stealing home is awesome. And we're going to we're going to practice that a little bit. But, man, we're going to hit every day. And we're going to throw bullpens every day. And we're going to you know go uh, take fungos every day. We're going to practice stealing home like once. Why? Because it's only going to affect maybe one game the entire season or maybe one game every three years. So, again, you got to prioritize and they get an idea of that repetition, what's important. And so if we make it important in a meeting, which we do, and as you know, uh, you know, the last few years, uh, the way we've gone about it and teaching our guys is the five to thrive, you know, one of your, you know, weekly programs, which I think is terrific because it gives it to them, you know, in small increments, right? It's not just this two hour seminar where, you know, your brain can kind of wander, you know, uh, you know, it's made up a little four minute videos, you know, that have, you know, an individual concept that they do every day, five days a week, 20 minutes a week. Then we go over it in that team meeting. I have them discuss it. I think it's great to be interactive rather than me just stand up and try to teach the mental game. I ask them questions, which in turn kind of puts some pressure on because they have to go 
do the videos and do the workbook so they can answer the questions because they're going to get called on. I'm going to say, hey, Brian, tell us about, you know, chapter one and, you know, you know, red lights and green lights and what did that mean and tell me what stood out for you. And that kid's going to have to say that in front of his teammates and the coaches. He's mm -hmm. going to have to have something to say. And so I think those are good. I think those are good teaching moments. And I think it's a it's a good way to di digest. And, and, you know, again, I know we're on your podcast and whatnot, but this, you know, I, I wouldn't be using you. You know, we could use anybody in the country. We're using you because I think you're the best. And I think it's a great tool uh, to, to hand off to, to our team. You know, another thing that, that, that I think is good is to get them to speak. I started doing it a few years ago um, where uh, people that are old enough remember the movie, remember the Titans, mm -hmm. right? And so the great movie with Denzel Washington, and he uh, t takes over as a head coach uh, where there's uh, um, uh, desegregating this high school and uh, having, you know, blacks and whites for the first time on a football team. And he makes a comment about uh, that he's going to have, there's a scene in the movie where you're going to have to learn you know, and be, you know, uh, be able to get up in front of your teammates and tell about one of your teammates of a different race and so we do that we split the team up and we give them a buddy and we make them have to learn one of their teammates and get up in front and talk about one another out in front of a, uh, their teammates because again I think that's one of those team building where everybody so not only is that kid learning because he's got to get up and say something but then everybody loves competition we do about five a meeting right well we give an award out for the best two guys that stood up in front of the guys. So we don't want them to just go, oh, this is Johnny. He's from North Carolina. And, you know, we want them to tell some fun facts and, and be energetic. And, you know, they Johnny knows how to do the Rubik's Cube. Well, they get the Rubik's Cube up there and, you know, Johnny has to do it. And we do different things to have the competition. And then they get some piece of garb, some maybe some cool pullover or T-shirt or hoodie or whatnot. And, uh, and, and again, I think it's a way for them to interact and, you know, it's kind of an indirect team building type thing because they don't even realize it, but they're getting to learn their teammates better. They're getting to feel more comfortable in front of their teammates. I think it's a good thing. Yeah. And they have to, and they, there's that confidence that comes, right? That when they speak in front of the team, just the way that they learn to now project themselves, right? And, the, and how that skill translates into everything that they do, how they then speak in class, which affects how they learn, which is, you know, how they speak to media, how they will speak to coaches. And ultimately, they're taking that with them for the rest of their life. And it's, it's amazing as an outsider who, you know, has inside access to different programs, the programs that do consistently put their players up to speak in front of the team, the different level of confidence and maturity that comes, I think over time of those players in the programs that get the sit and get, they always walk in, they sit down right. and get talked to by the coach. So right. for our coaches on the call, I think one of the best things you can do consistently is put your players up in front of, of their teammates to be able to speak and to learn about each other. And, you know, coach B, I know one of the best activities I had the chance to to see live one time when I was with you guys playing down in, in Baton Rouge against LSU was the perspective poster yeah. and having your players present on a perspective poster. And I know, I think that's one of the infants, one of the first things that maybe skip asked you to do on some road trip, Mike, go get yeah. a bunch of newspapers. Could you kind of tell the story of the perspective poster yeah. and how you use that too? Yeah, you know, well, you're right. It, you know, we got it. Uh, you know, you talk about it much, I think, in, in your seminars. But, you know, my first experience was, you know, back in you know the 90s. And I don't remember the year, but we we, we hit a you know, tough spot, you know, at LSU. And I remember Skip saying, hey, I want you to go out and I want you to buy, you know, every newspaper, you know, the, all the local newspapers, but the Wall Street Journal and all these. And he goes, I want you to cut out you know, all the bad stuff, you know, like a stock market crashing and, you know, all these different things. And, you know, uh, you know, two-year-old, you know, suffocates and, you know, all these like bad things. And I mean, it's tough cutting this stuff out, right. That, uh, you know, you you do this and we posted or glued it all to a poster and, you know, we, he wrote on top of the poster compared to what, Right. And uh, and and so obviously the idea is, hey, you know, we haven't played well this 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 weekend or this week or maybe you haven't individually. And I know you feel bad and not that you shouldn't feel bad. We, we're all invested in this and bad things happen to everybody. 
but compared to what? Like you're you're 0 for seven so far in a series, or we we're 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 on the verge of losing our fourth game in a row. Uh, but this is a family of seven that just lost their home last night, you know, in Winchester, Virginia, you know, in, a, in an electrical fire. Or this is a a person that uh, um, you know got in a car accident and he lost his entire family, you know, or you know the the job market's down or whatever it is. And so, you know, the, the perspective poster is to give them an idea because a lot of times we know that as adults, but we it's hard for us to get perspective, but it's really hard for an 18 year old kid. You know, they, they live in that bubble and they, they only know, they don't read papers, they don't watch the news, they don't, they don't get any of that information. And all, the, all that's important to them is that at bat or that game. And so it's a, it's a chance for them to gain some perspective. And then when you have them do it individually, it's amazing. You know, they start knowing about Uncle Bob that has cancer. They start to, you know, see those different things, you know, that, you know, uh, you know, my, my grandfather had to work three jobs, you know, to, to, to get my father, you know, you know, uh, food on the table and those different things. So, you know, again, I think it kind of educates their perspective, if you will. Yeah. I remember, I remember being with you guys and, and I've got video of this was, was you watching it in preparation for this call and, you know, um, players standing up and they had their own individual perspective poster for the coaches that are watching this going, okay, I love this activity. How do I do this? So each player made like their own, call it a PowerPoint slide collage of different images. And, and in the team room, you would put up the PowerPoint slide of the, of the player's personal perspective poster, and they would have to talk through each of the items that were on there and then select one of those items to go onto a team perspective poster. And then there was a team poster that was being built that would hang by the bat rack or in the, in the dugout. And I thought it was a, was an exercise that, you know, coach B, I remember first seeing that in Skip Bertman's video, winning the big one. Right. And I think I've probably, I, I've used it every year. I make one for myself every year. I've used it with countless teams. And I can tell you as a coach that when you do this, um, there won't be a dry eye in the room when people are yeah. talking about their perspective, you know, and, yeah. and there wasn't a dry eye at the college world series when the Ole Miss Rebs were dogpiling winning the 2022 national championship. Now coach, one of the things that has impressed me the most about you over the course of our time together is your ability to tell a story, to tell a story, to tell the right story in the right way at the right time to move your team. So what I want to do here is give you just a minute to think about a story. You can tell oh, our wow. team of coaches about what, you know, and, and maybe talk, tell the story and then we'll ask questions about how do you pick oh, what story wow. and when. And as you tell a story to us, like you would tell in the outfield to your team, I'm going to take a minute and just give you a second to think about that. Because what I want to do is I want to make sure that uh, I take a minute to recognize uh, Mike Bahoon and Fundraising University as they were recently named the number one franchise in their category in Entrepreneur Magazine. And also would like to welcome Zach Sorensen as a new vice president of sales to Fundraising University. And for the coaches on the call that are in need of money for your programs and you want to see significant results with a fundraiser in one hour. That, that will then carry on for a week, but in the least amount of time to make the most amount of money, please contact uh, CEO of Fundraising University, Mike Bahoon. I'm going to post his email here in the chat. So go ahead and open up our chat. We'll also post this in the show notes. Uh, it's M Bahoon, B-A-H-U-N at fundraisingu.net to inquire more about how you can help your program dream big and raise more. Fundraising University raises the most amount of money in the least amount of time. And I want to just take a second here before we turn it back to coach Mike Bianco to talk about his a story for us of the top fundraising groups in 2022. So you see Huntley High School football in a one hour fund you now $106,000 in a one hour fundraiser. If we go to number 29, Eastmont High School in Wenatchee, Washington, I know that one well because I actually had the privilege of running that with athletic director Russ Waterman at Eastmont High School. And in one hour, couldn't be easier. We made $28,485 in a fundraiser. So if you're interested, again, you can reach out to M Bahoon at fundraisingu.net. I'll also give you my personal email, Brian at BrianCane.com. Feel free to send me an email. Uh, I have I have executed the fundraiser for fundraising you and to do 30,000 in an hour was mind blowing to me. Speaking about being mind blown, Coach Bianco, we're coming back to you here talking about stories and how you use these with your team before a game. I'm going to turn it over to you and see how we go. Okay, Brian. Well, there was a businessman, gentleman, 
you know, uh, about your age, guy in his 40s, and he was driving around. He's got his uh, iPhone, you know, set to maps, and he's uh, trying to find uh, this place of business where he's supposed to do a presentation. But he's in the back road somewhere in Kentucky. And as he's looking down his phone, a narrow two lane road, he runs off the side of the road. His car gets into a ditch and he puts it in reverse, can't get out, drive, can't get out. He's stuck. And he's like, wow, I don't have great service. I don't know how far long I can get to get somebody to, to tow me out of this. And he looks up, you know, about a quarter mile up the road, there's a little farmhouse. And so he gets out in his suit. He walks up the, you know, the dirt road and goes, knocks on the farmhouse door. And old farmer answers the door. And he said, hi, sir. He said, uh, listen, I don't know if you can help me, but you know, I'm kind of lost here. I've been trying to you know, find his place of business here. But because I just ran off the road uh, you know, about a quarter mile down the road. And I was wondering, is there any way uh, that you can help me you know, get my car out of the ditch? And the farmer looks out the door and goes, yeah, old Warwick can get you out. Okay, he goes, you know, Warwick, and he points over to the field, an old mule in the field he goes that's warwick he goes warwick can get you out and he goes i got nothing to lose he says okay let, let's give it a shot so the farmer grabs warwick the mule and they walk back down the road and the farmer hooks him up to the car tells the man to get in the car and uh and then all of a sudden the farmer goes pull jack pull ted pull paul pull warwick and with that Warwick pulls the car right out of the ditch onto the dirt road. And so the man gets out of his car. He's amazed. He's flabbergasted. And he looks at the farmer. He goes, thank you, sir, so much. He goes, I really appreciate you saved me a lot of time. I'm going to be able to get to my meeting now. He said, but before I leave, I got to ask you. He said, you know, uh, before you mentioned Warwick's name, you said, pull Ted, pull, what were all those names that you mentioned before you said, pull Warwick? And he said, well, because yeah, to be honest with you, Warwick's kind of old and he's blind and he don't mind pulling as long as he's pulling part of it as part of a team. And so, you know, a great lesson for us, you know, a lot of us, you know, don't mind doing a lot of stuff as long as we're doing it together and we're doing it as part of a team. Uh, you know, so, you know, one of the one of the stories, one of the favorites, you know, that uh, uh, goes into the, the library, the Ole Miss baseball stories. Yeah, and, and and then after the story, right? You, I, there, I've I've seen it because I've been there many times when you've done it. Is there's a little a little, uh, I don't know if I how I would say it. There's there's a saying like you you tell the story, you tie it back to the game, and say to remember today we're going to yeah. be relentless. We're going to could you kind of tell us how do you yeah. finish off all those well, stories? Well, and, tie it back and to you the know the, the the truth is you know for years, and you're exactly right. And again, it's repetition, mother of skill, and say today. You know, um, it's important to, to be like Warwick and be part of a team. You know, today, you know, in, in our pursuit, we want to be excellent. You know, we want to show that relentlessness that, that we talk about so much. Certainly, we want to show the belief and then we want to, you know, uh, be selfless. So today, play like reps. And so, uh, and then even this year, you know, we started, you know, using because uh, somebody had you know, spoken to the team earlier, a guy named Luis Garcia. It went to the Skip Burtman because Luis played for LSU. He told them to play like champions. And so, um, you know, kind of a, a neat end to the story. So, uh, and then I think the closing of the story is important, you know, as you mentioned, and you so much so that you caught me with it, right? So I didn't end it. I was ending it for these people here, but, but you're right. I think it, it it's good to have an ending. I think it's, you know, when I gave the speech at the ABCA just a few days ago, you know, so, so much, I think we worry about the body, which is the important part. And usually we're going to get that right, but it's the beginning to grab their attention and then the close to make sure that, you know, you kind of wrap it up in a bow and that they understand. I think that's part of the, you know, the, you know giving a speech or telling a story is that you can kind of wrap it up and they go, Oh, I get it. You know, I understand now. Mm. And I want to make sure that I mentioned on our call here for anybody who's with us and for all the coaches that are on this call live, if you have a question for coach Mike Bianco, please put it inside of the chat. We'll make sure we get to those questions. If it's a question about where, you know, storytelling, if it's a question about his culture, if it's a question about the championship season, if it's a, anything that you have, please feel free to put it in here and, um, and, and we'll get that question answered coach. How do you identify what story to tell? Where do you find your stories? How do you stay organized with them? I mean, that's one of the things that's been most impressive to me. Uh, so I want to make sure that we share that with our coaches, because I believe coaches understand the power of storytelling, but maybe sometimes don't know where to get started, what type of story to tell, et cetera. 
Well, you know, first, and I tell people this often, uh, you know, most of what we all do, right? We, we get from somebody else, a mentor. You know, I, I'll even be as bold to say, hey, we stole them. We stole that idea. We took that idea from somebody else. And Coach Burton used to tell stories uh, before the, each game to the to the guys and he would get them you know through books and whatnot and he would back then it was you know their computers weren't you know super prevalent but he had one even in his you know I guess 50s and 60s and he would type out the stories himself and I think it was a way for him to memorize them well then he would keep them and then one of my jobs you know uh one of the years right before I left was, hey, would you make a copy of these and just kind of organize and put them in a, you know, kind of a book form, put them in a notebook. And so I did, you know, try to put them in, you know, adversity, uh, staying consistent, you know, being at your best and try to kind of main idea theme wise, put them in some type of table of contents. And instead of making one copy, I made two copies, you know, one for him and one for me. And so I put them all in a notebook. And then when I left it, uh, a year later to to become a head coach, I brought those stories with me. And at first I started telling them, you know, once a week and uh, because it's hard and most people don't like to do hard things. And then, and, and, you know, telling the story is not that hard, uh, but, you know, memorizing it and trying to find the right story for the, you know, the right moment. And, uh, and so it takes a little bit of work. And so I had the stories that he had given me, but as time goes on, uh, because of technology, because of the internet, um, you know, I started to get more and more. And then as people heard that I, I told stories, people would give them to me. Like, you know, I think you gave me that story, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Warwick story. And so over time, people go, hey, man, this is a neat story. You might want to share with your team. And you start to gather them. Um, and then probably, you know, since, you know, the, the theft of the Bertman stories after that, uh, my biggest ones are just from reading. And uh, uh, and I never used to read. And I'm, and I'm not a good reader. You know, I, I'm not. Uh, I think I have a little dyslexia. You know, I know my son does. I've never been tested, uh, but I, I never enjoyed reading growing up. I uh, and that's one of the reasons that we you know we have our guys read a book and uh, at, at Christmas time because I don't think at that age they they read much, and so I think it's really good for them to read. You know, the players and two is usually you know we're going to give them a book that I think is kind of the the mantra or the message for the for the season and that they can get something out of it. But I make sure that it, I'm not giving them some 600 page, you know, novel. It's something that's, you know, a little easier to digest. So a lot of the books are that John Gordon type where they're short little stories, fables, if you will, 140 pages with a lot of chapters so they can get through them quickly. So they'll read them because I want them to read them. I want them to, you know, again, you know, digest them and, and get the points uh, of the story. And so, uh, I started reading. I normally read uh, nonfiction. I, I started reading just coaching biographies, and it doesn't matter if it's a football coach. But, but you know, I just thought it. You know, to me, it's it's very um, uh, interesting. You know, to to read about Bill Parcells or you know Mike Shashevsky, and and uh, you know they're they're good reads, and you know they're usually not like reading you know the Benjamin Franklin biography where you know you you go for about the you know a hundred pages and you still haven't got to age five yet. You know, those books usually, you know, the, 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 the biographies of, you know, contemporary coaches, usually there's a chapter of their upbringing, you know, where they're from, you know, what their parents were like, and then usually it gets quickly, you know, to, you know, the part that we all want to read. And so, you know, I love reading those books. Uh, but then I started with, you know, reading self-improvement books and uh, uh, which are great. Uh, and this is just one man's opinion, but I've read so many of them over time. Um, uh, I, I think if you read as much as I do, I read about a book a week. And so uh, I used to read like a biography and then a self-help book, then a biography and self kind of just going back and forth. The biographies, biographies don't get old you know, because it's a new story and they're, they're cool. And some of them, they're not biographies. Maybe I'll read like, uh, I forget what I just read, but it was about Larry Dolby and Satchel Paige and how they were the two first African-American players in the American League. You know, just a neat story, but again, and, you know, nonfiction story was, you know, terrific. But what I found out about the uh, self-help books is they can all kind of blend together. You know, so I think you got to be careful how many of those that you're reading and digesting and and not, you know, that they're not helpful and good, but it's like try and 
15 diets, you know, like, you know, I think you, you got to kind of figure out what you like and stay with it, you know, and not that you can't come up with some different ideas and concepts, but I try not to read as many self-help books as I once did, because it's just, it's just hard, you know, just too many ideas and too much information. A lot of them are same. It's just different verbiage. And so I think you kind of got to find, you know, what, what fits you, but I get to that reading point because when you're starting to read 50 books a year, you're going to get stories, right? And you're reading biographies. If it's from Katie Couric or, you know, Bob Costas's biography, and there's going to be little stories in there where, you know, I've gotten one about Oprah Winfrey. And, and so they don't always have to be athlete stories. I think it's interesting to hit the, the players in a lot of different ways. And uh, I used to think that the, the true stories or the, uh, the, uh, the nonfiction stories were best, but like ones like Warwick, uh, sometimes they like the best. So, so it's kind of, you know, it's a good mix. You know, and I think uh, Success Hotline with Dr. Rob Gilbert has been a great resource for me yeah. for years, you know, for people getting stories. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, wherever you're picking up your podcast, just type in Success Hotline. Dr. Rob Gilbert, you know, is one is one where you can get some great stories. And, you know, Coach, I want to... Um, I want to have you talk. I got so much, so, so much. I want to break down here. I want to talk about uh, two more stories that are key and then sure. have you talk about one um, uh, related to the compound effect. But when we, when we're talking about stories, I want to, I want to share a story uh, that has actually got a documentary made f- from Skip Bertman about holding the rope. Now, if you can see the screen here, we go years ago. This is you <laughs> holding the rope. I, I got a little bit of hair on my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Being being pulled up the stadium wall, right, with your team down there to catch you should you fall. Luckily, that did not happen. But here you are literally holding the rope. Would you tell the concept of hold the rope? Because I think it's one that's tremendous yeah. that all coaches can take and use regardless of sport. Well, it, it's a story in itself. And and so, yeah, the, the legendary Skip Bertman. So he came to LSU in 1984 and coached there to 2001, I believe, was his final season at LSU. I think he coached 18 years in the 90s. For those that aren't baseball you know, fans or college baseball fans, in the 90s, Coach Bertman won five national championships in 10 years. So he was the Nick Saban. He was the John Wooden of college baseball in the 90s. And I was fortunate to have played for him in the late 80s. I was a junior college transfer, so I played for two years. Years, and then uh, came back and coached for him uh, in the 90s for five years and was there for three of the uh, five national championships. So anyway, the story goes that uh, in 1984, uh, this first year, uh, he brought you know the players in, and again, he's trying to develop a culture. He's trying to develop a you know uh, you know some chemistry, and he had like a not as thick as a rope as you saw, but you know like a little thin rope. And he bring the guys in front, and they sit down in front of his desk, and as he's talking to him, he flipped the rope over the desk. Then he asked the players individually as they came in, if you were you know uh, on one side of this rope holding on, and over the side of a building. And the only thing that keeping you from from death and 500 foot fall was your teammate on the other side, on top of the building, holding the other side of the rope. Which teammate would you want to hold the rope? And so, of course, you know, uh, Rob Leary, the catcher, comes in and says, you know, Jeff Yurton, the third baseman. And of course, when uh, Rebel A comes in there, he'd say Mark Guthrie, a pitcher. And so, you know, they're either picking a strong guy or a guy that, you know, was their buddy and so on. And at the end, when he was all done, he brought them all together. And he said, when I flip the rope over and I ask you, who would you want to hold, be holding the other side of the rope? Is, you know, your answer should be any, anybody, as long as it's an LSU baseball player, which one of my teammates you know, when you can answer it that way, sincerely, then we've become one. And so uh, fast forward uh, a year later, they're a year and a half later, they're playing uh, the final game of the season at Auburn. And uh, they're winning by one run. And it's the bottom of the ninth inning. And if they get this out, this final out, then they're going to be the SEC Western Division champs. And the people need to know that this is LSU baseball. This is how LSU baseball became LSU baseball. They had never won anything like this before. And so with two outs in bottom of ninth, the guy at second base, one run lead, fly ball, average routine fly ball to left field, left fielder goes under it. But as the ball goes up, you could tell in the dugout, the guys were just kind of like looking outside the dugout, weren't sure if he was going to catch it. And of course, he dropped it. Routine fly ball. Run scores, ties it up, they go extra innings. 
they go ahead in the 12th inning. And then the same thing happened. You know, if you know, they got it out and next thing you know, there's a ground ball and a guy bobbled it and a run scored. And then they go to the, like the 14th inning. And so now there's two outs. Uh, they're one out away from, from winning again. And finally, the third, the catcher, Rob Leary, comes out and yells out to the pitcher, hey, Stan, hold the rope. And then, of course, Jeff Yurt and the third baseman goes to Jeff Rebele, hey, hold the rope. And so it was kind of like this chain that went around the field that, you know, one player, the center fielder went to the right fielder, hold the rope. And so of course, the next ground, the next pitch was a ground ball to Yurt in the third baseman. But as he's catching the ball, the dugout is unloading, you know, for the dog pile because they have that confidence that 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 belief is transferable. They didn't have it, you know, a few innings ago, but now they got it and as Yurt throws the ball and it's a strike right over to the first baseman. You know, of course, they knew he was going to do it, believed that he was going to do it. They knew that he would hold the rope for him. And so um, they win the championship. It was the first championship that they've ever won, you know, at LSU, the conference championship. And so it kind of became their mantra, if you will, hold the rope. And basically what it means is, you know, the metaphorical rope that you got to be there and believe and your, your, your teammates have to trust you uh, and believe in you that you're going to get the job done. Love that. Love that. Another great story, coach, and concept that you've used with your team to kind of create that mindset of Rebs. And this was an old look at your old complex in the classroom that you had there as a way yeah. to display the, that that culture. And on the other wall, the other side of the room was this, the road to Omaha, 200 feet at a time, 788 miles. And you had mapped out, you know, 200, 200 feet at a time in that focus. And in 2009, when you won the Southeastern Conference Championship, uh, you had putting on the rings 200 feet at a time. Talk yeah. about that focus on the next 200 feet where it meant so much to your program that you put it on a ring and get it put up on the wall inside of your, your team room, the opposite of your core culture. Right. I, I think it's another, you know, um, another way of saying, you know, that present moment focus. And so, you know, uh, you know, we, we, we realize that getting from Oxford to Omaha, if you map it is, you know, 788 miles. Um, but as you've mentioned and you've explained to the players, um, if you were leaving at nighttime, you know, what would you need? You know, of course, nowadays, everybody says, well, I need GPS, but, but more specifically to drive those, you know, 788 miles, well, what, what do you need? And the, the, the obvious answer is headlights, right? It's nighttime. And, and so you're trusting, you know, that, cause all you can see, you can't see the 788 miles. All you can see is the 200 feet that the light, that the headlights shine in front of you. And so, yeah, you're going to do the 788 miles, but you're going to do it 200 feet at a time you know so for an athlete yeah the goal may be to win a national championship and that's great and a lot of people i think get lost into the mental game and they talk about well you know hey you know I, I, yeah i want to win a pitch and i want to be present but you know i want to win a championship or it's about getting hits well what's the best way to get that end result to, to get the hit or to win the championship is to have a good today right or more specifically to have a good practice or maybe even more specifically than that is just to have a good meal, right? That leads to a good practice. And so all these small increments, all those 200 feet are that present moment focus that, you know, all, everybody talks about the mental game is, you know, let me, you know, let me control what I can control. And all I can control is the next 200 feet, the next pitch, the next snap on a football game, you know, the, the, the next, you know, uh, a possession in a basketball game, you know, those types of things, you know, I can't get caught up in, you know, we, we, we open up, you know, uh, February 17th uh and the national championship is not until the end of june and although those are going to be goals although the goal is to win on february 17th and the goal is to win a national championship but you know we're worried about what we're going to do on sunday night which is the first day that we're going to be with the guys and so we're not talking about february 17th and we're not talking about june 25th we're talking about our early defense and those types of things so we we as coaches do it but we also have to train the players that you know this is the reason the best way to get the hit is to be able to do what you can do to win this pitch, you know, to have a quality of bat. 
Yeah. And that quality at bat, that, that quality at bat, that day's practice, that is the process, right? I think a lot of times, you know, right. when I, when I'll meet with professional players, uh, I'll even have them when I start, start talking about, tell me your process of how you, how you go through and prepare. I had a, a player who has since this meeting won a sign award say to me, you know, I hear people talk about process. What exactly does that mean? You know, and in some programs where they just hear the word process, but no one ever literally says it's the series of steps that you take to give you the best chance of success. It's how you prepare. Then it's just it's it's words on a wall instead of something that they can gravitate to. And, you know, coach, one of the things, too, that I I know you did and coach Cliff Godwin, who we've had on here with with coaching matters, who's the head baseball coach at East Carolina, was an assistant with you in, in Oxford. One of the things that you both do that he talked about and. Uh, I think is a great idea that coaches can take and use is this idea of having a t-shirt that has kind of a team motto on the back. And here, this picture uh, is a t-shirt that says, you know, you're never out of the fight and it's in a case and it's got number 12 on it. Could you talk about how, how you use that kind of player of the game t-shirt mentality or idea in your program? Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things is it's great to get different ideas from guys like you or to hear, you know, different coaches like myself or Cliff or other ones and say, and it's all right to use those ideas. There's nothing wrong with that. But this was one that, you know, came, I was a head coach at McNeese State and, um, and again, had a little bit of that process with Ken Revisit 95 and 96, but here it is, you know, now uh, fall of 1998 uh, or fall of 1997. And I'm out for a jog, you know, at McNeese State in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And, uh, uh, and I remember thinking about how do I get them, you know, we have these goals of winning 40 regular season games, win the Southland Conference, you know, going to you know, postseason. We have these different goals that everybody has, but how do I get them to focus on tonight's game? you know, against Texas Southern, you know, uh, the first game of the year. And what I came up with as I was jogging, you know, a few of my, whenever I I jogged back down, you know, a couple miles was if I could get a number, you know, and put it on the door. And so when they walked out of the door, they would see this number one. And so, yeah, the goal is to win 40 games. The goal is to get to Omaha and all the things that we have as, as coaches and as players, but there's no way that I can get to those goals without taking care of this first. The right? present moment, the first 200 feet is taking care of number one. And so we we actually put it on a kind of a laminated board uh, and, you know, we printed out a bunch of them, but would be number one. So it would hang on the door as they walked out. So a reminder, number one, most important thing is number one. And then when they went out to the, to, to the dugout and had batting practice, we'd have the manager tape it to the wall. So during the game, as they went to get their bat, as they went to get their glove, they would see number one out there. And if we won at, you know, at, out in right field, I'd talk about the game and I'd say, hey, you know, today was a great game, team victory. But one of the reasons we won was in the seventh inning, Brian Kane came up and, you know, he was selfless and got a, you know, sacrifice bunt down, pushed that runner to third base. We were able to go ahead and Brian later made a big play, you know, on a, on a, a, a double play ball up the middle, made a nice play up the middle. And so I, player of the game, I gave it, you know, to Brian Kane, you know, the number one. And then the next day when the guys came to practice, there'd be a number two sitting there. And so, but if we lost, that number two would go back into the locker room, be sitting there as a reminder that we can't get to three, we can't get to five, we can't get to 40 until we take care of number two. And uh, and so when I got to Ole Miss, a little bigger budget, you know, we stopped giving away these little plastic laminated numbers and started putting, you know, the theme of the year, you know, like this year, you know, the, we read the energy bus, as I mentioned. And so the, the mantra, you know, at the end of every video the you know, the, on the t-shirt, it has the, an old Miss bus and it says, enjoy the ride and, uh, you know, good and bad. And, uh, and so we could put the t-shirts and now they have a t-shirt that they're proud of and they can wear every day. They can wear to practice, they can wear it to pregame meal and so on. So, you know, it's kind of become a hit here, you know, over the years. Love that. And coach, I know a big hit in your program is the book, The Compound Effect. And if I'm not mistaken, I think over your left shoulder, that's a stack of compound effect books right there. Is it not? It is. How about that? Look at that. I, I, and, and, and part of how I recognize the compound effect there is I cannot remember if it was you or Jim Schlossnagel that gave me my first copy of it's the me. compound effect. I think it was, it was. me. <laughs> it was me. And Jim's so, probably using it now because he uses it every year. We switch the book every, you know, uh, every year. We recycle. We we used. Uh, I don't know how, what, how many years ago we 
uh, we used it. But one of the cool things, it's a great edit, ed editor thing that it says, you know, if you like the book and you care about it, then you can buy five copies and give it to different people. It was actually given to me by Dan McDonald, the head coach at Louisville and uh, read it. And still to this day, I, you know, I kind of, you know, told you that not that I'm against the self-help books. I think they're terrific. But I think just like in, in most of them, you know, especially the good ones, I think they work if you really, you know, you know, uh, put them to use. But uh, I think the compound effect, in my opinion, is the best self-help book. You know, the the cleanest, the easiest. Uh, I think it's terrific. I mean, what, you know, for and not just for coaches, I mean, and not just for players. I mean, because it really has nothing to do with athletics. I mean, it's a it's a business book. It's written by Darren Hardy, who was the editor for such a long time for Success Magazine. I mean, so, you know, you're talking about an entrepreneur, not a, you know, not a you know, professional athlete. But those lessons, like a lot of lessons in athletics, translate to you know, your everyday life. So that's the book for this year. Matter of fact, I got to go bust it open because, you know, I hadn't read it and, you know, the kids read it over the break. So I'm going to New York, you know, tomorrow morning. And so, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to crush it over the next, you know, few days and, you know, a couple of airports. For, for about the 20th time, I'm sure. How many times mm -hmm. do you think you've read the compound? Yeah. Effect? Well, Probably, I'm, I don't know about 20, but probably for sure over five. And yeah. so I, I have my own hard copy at home that's dog-eared and highlighted. And and so it's a lot of times better for me to read that copy, you know, just because, you know, uh, to see where I am. Because, yeah. you know, a lot of times things that you thought were really good or so important to you, you know, maybe five, six years ago. And it's amazing. I'm not good. I'm not as good at that. As, and I should be better at it that those types of books that are really good because how many times have we've watched, you know, a TV show again, right. Or watched a movie. I mean, there's movies that, you know, I've, you know, they keep coming up on TV and you know, I've watched a billion times, but, but sometimes we won't read books again, you know, for, for some reason. And uh, uh, I don't know why that is. Um, but, but for the, the compound effect, I've read at least five, five plus times and, and, I probably can count on one hand how many books I've read more than once. So, yeah. you know, obviously I think it's a good one. Yeah. Now I'd say that the two books that I have read the most, more than any, more than any other one multiple times would be heads up baseball by Revisa and in mm -hmm. the compound effect, you know? So if people yeah. are, are into the mental game, they're getting it here. And speaking about being into, into the mental game, I want to just, again, take time to thank Mike Bahoon and fundraising university and let you know as coaches that they're always looking for individuals across the country who are competitive, empathetic, organized, self-starters and teachable to partner with. So if you're interested in learning more, about fundraising university either as a coach or as a potential franchise owner if you're if you're business minded and you'd love to love to work with coaches and athletes while owning your own business please contact mike bahoon m bahoon b-a-h-u-n at fundraisingu.net to learn more about becoming a franchise owner with fundraising university i'll make sure i put coach bahoon's email in the chat as well coach bianco i want to take it to some of our coaches and will hansen asked a question he said what's the number one thing that you can, can could tell a high school player about the mental game of baseball uh, and about kind of the mental process of the game. And you've raised a couple of high school baseball players who are now playing yeah. in college, right? I think all of your boys are now playing in college at Louisville or LSU. What, um, what do you, what would you tell a high school player about the mental game? I, I think that's the hardest thing. And you, you mentioned earlier about, you were talking to an athlete that won a Cy Young that when he was asked about the process, couldn't define it. I forget exactly what you said, but, but I, I think it's hard to not have success uh, as an athlete. And usually if you're talking to a high school player, that's a pretty good player. You know, he may not uh, know that's what he's doing uh, in certain areas of his game. Like for example, if he's a hitter, uh, you know, if you said, Hey, tell me about the mental game, tell me about the process. And, you know, the high school kid goes, wow, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. I just, you know, I go up there, see white, hit white. I'm just a, okay, well, let's watch this video of you instead of walking to the plate. And then here's a video of you walking to the plate uh, yesterday. And if you look, you're walking to the plate the same way. If you look, you look down at the third base coach and you got the signal and the way you stepped in the box and we got the video, you know, side by side and you're doing the exact same thing just like a golfer stepping over a putt and the way he approaches the putt and the way he does his practice swing and the way he dresses the ball. And so he may not call it his routine. He may not call it that. He may not even be aware of that, 
right? Uh, he may call it something like his, his you know, ritual or whatever, but it is, as in the mental game, as you know, you've defined as it is your routine. And, and, and so to be conscious of that routine, to understand that the mental game is, is very broad, you know, and, and that I don't think it's, it's, it's one, 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 uh, uh, one piece is it fits all. I think you have to find what you're comfortable with. And I think some guys delve, you know, further into it in the routine and their breathing and, and everything. And, and some people, you know, it, it's just good enough to have, to be conscious of my routine and be conscious of that, you know, I, I want to stay in the present. You know, those are some of the things that I think are the most important. I think, you know, taking a breath, I think, you know, which goes to the routine. And I think, of, of and, and staying in the present is probably the most difficult, you know, because we're human and our minds wander and it's easy to want to get result oriented. Uh, but again, when you start to explain the process that, hey, we're not saying we don't want hits. I mean, hits are what eventually win games. But how do you get hits? And how do you get hits are to have quality at bats. How do I have quality bits at bats is to start winning pitches, swinging at good pitches and letting go bad pitches, having a good approach and so on. And so we can keep breaking it down, whittling it down. What's the best way to get a hit? It's not about thing I need to get a hit. It's about, you know, whatever that routine is and, and what, what is the best way for you? Cause everybody's built different, you know, and what their routine, what their self-talk, what all of those things, they're different for everybody. And so even though that some people may not know that they have a routine, maybe there's some people that don't know that they have this self-talk. If you, Brian Kane or me, were to ask them about their routine or, okay, let's watch you walk to the plate or let's watch you step on the mound. Okay, what do you, is there something you say to yourself when you're when things are going well? What do, you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you say to yourself? Well, I don't talk to myself. Yeah, you do. Everybody talks to themselves. What's that guy in your brain? What's what's he say? And, you know, some some of it is a, an aggressive, hey, crush this baseball. And some of them are more of a mechanical, hey, be on time, get my foot down. You know, some of these things are different for, for everybody, you know, but just like the basketball player that's getting to the foul line, like you, everybody has, you know, you watch it, he bounces it three times takes his breath. He may not know, he may not have been taught by an expert like you that that's his routine, but he has a routine. You know, he may not think he does because he's never been taught it that way, but he does. You know, everybody has different routines and to be able to try to control more of those self-talks, be able to control more of those routines, puts you in a better shot to succeed. It's not a, you know, a guarantee, but again, that's why the guy that's leaning over the putt for a million dollars to win the Masters is stepping up to that putt the same way that he steps up to every putt. It doesn't guarantee him to, you know, make that putt, but it gives him the best shot to make that putt, you know, right? And, and he knows that. It gives you the best shot to make the foul shot. You don't just grab it and throw a you know, foul shot up. You grab the ball from the ref, you spin it like that, three dribbles, deep breath, boom. That gives you the best shot. Now, when the game's on the line and you're up by one and you need to make your two free throws, you don't just throw it up there. You spin it like that, dribble three times. And you know there's no guarantee, but that gives you your best shot, you know, or best percentage to make it. Yeah, that, that probably should be the title of this podcast is how to give yourself the best chance for success. And it's yeah. about the process. It's about the stories. Yeah. It's about the culture. It's about the videos. It's about building belief and being relentless with your commitment to excellence and being selfless. And be, uh, being conscious of those. Yeah. I think that's the difference is people, people have all of those, but they're not, they're not conscious. You know, they, like I said, they call them superstitions or, or, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and I think one of the things that people don't do or athletes don't do is when things aren't going well, you know, everybody wants to watch video. Then everybody wants to start to analyze their swing or their pitching mechanics or their shot or whatever it is. Um, but if you're a true student of the game and you know more about the process and, and you learn from people like you, you should be analyzing things when they're going well. And chances are, if you're getting to this point, you're probably a good player in you know, one way or another. 
And so start taking notes, you know, when you have a good day and what, what are you thinking? What are you, what are you saying to yourself? You know, what, you know, you didn't think you had a routine, but what, what are you doing every day? When you go to bed, when you're waking up, what are you doing before the game? You know, how, how are you, you know, like you explained about that hourglass, you know, how are you, how are you getting into that phone booth and taking off your street clothes and putting on your uniform and becoming Superman? You know, what does that process work for you? And everybody's different. Some people want to get to the field five hours beforehand and they want to, and that's, that's their happy place. And that's how they go. Some people, yeah, well, I don't care about that. I just need to get up and get my uniform, but you know, guess what? I bet you put your socks on the same way, just about every single day. You know, you, you put your shoes on about the same way every single day you step into the box. So you, you have it. It's just different. It's a routine. It's just different. It may be faster, mm. but it's, it's, the, it's the same routine for you. Yeah. And, you know, coach, last question for you. And you, you've alluded to it when you were doing your free free show, ex, free throw example. And I know there's some guys in the NBA we're going to be sending your way to get some free throw coaching. You talked about the importance of the breath. Talk about the importance of the breath. And if you watch your team play last year and you'll get everyone who's on the call, you'll get to see Ole Miss play on TV this year, whether it's the SEC Network or on ESPN Plus, you can find their games easy enough. You'll see your pitchers take a breath before each pitch. You'll see your guys take a breath before they get in or in the box as they get set up. Talk about the importance of breathing. Well, you know, it's it's the one thing that's proven, you know, anatomically that if you do take that breath, it will slow your heart rate down. So everybody talks about in those nervous moments, whatever it is, how can how can the guy stand over the putt knowing that if he makes it, he gets a million dollars. If he misses it, he loses a million dollars. How can he do it? I, man, I would be shaken. Well, you know, one thing is he's done it a lot. But that doesn't mean just because you've done it a lot that you don't feel the pressure in the moment. But the only thing that you got to go back to is your breath and your routine. And so if you can get back to that, you're not trying to win a million dollars. You're trying to stay in your routine and in the, the process and taking a breath. And so one of the things that you know you try to train yourself, and I think I've tried to be better at as a coach, I'm walking on the stage you know, a couple of days ago in front of 8,000 people. Now, somebody goes, have you ever spoken in front of 8,000 people? I go, what do you think, I'm the president? Like, who speaks in front of 8,000 people? Like, it, you get maybe that opportunity once in a lifetime if you're lucky, right? And so, yeah, I'm, I'm nervous, and I got nervous energy. Um, and so as I'm sitting there and as he's reading my bio, the only thing that I could – think of is to take a couple deep breaths so as he's reading you know our next speaker and i'm just going and and again i'm just trying to get myself into that moment and slow my heart rate down so i can do the best job that i can Mm -hmm. and so uh all athletes do it they just sometimes don't realize they do it and what you've shown us uh, i'll never forget uh, the very first time that you came, you showed us, you know, a, a batter coming to the box, Cal State Fullerton catcher, and how how uh, he had a bad College World Series, and then the next year how he had a good College World Series, and you showed how his routine was sped up. And you can see it now, again, to the naked eye, you wouldn't have known, but if you can cut the video and look, you can actually see that the, there it is. How, how, how much more relaxed and how, and again, I don't know if you're just watching the game, if you think, you know, Suzuki is on the left, you know, nervous, but you can see like it's, it, the, the breath is shorter. It's not as quick. He's running through that breath. And the other one, it's more deliberate. And then of course you see statistically, he's, you know, just a much better hitter, you know, when his routine, you know, is, is, is more closer to what his normal routine is. Mm. Yeah, coach, you know, I think that that's that's the power of the breath, right? You mentioned it, it anatomically, physiologically slows the heart rate down, improves reaction time, brings oxygen in the system, you know, and allows you to think more clearly and ultimately make better decisions, which does not guarantee you success. It guarantees you one thing, the best chance for success. And for our that's coaches it. who have been here today, I hope that's one of the main things that you take away from Coach Mike Bianco and his system is that the system is there to give you the best chance for success, regardless of how you feel, regardless of, of you know if your team is number one in the country or your team has been on a skid and you're not ranked at all. It gives you the best chance for success. And sometimes that best chance for success takes you all the way to be the, being the last team standing coach Bianco. It's been a privilege to have you on the coaching matters group coaching program and podcast here. Thank you for making time, man. Always a pleasure and best of luck to you this season. Go Rebs. Thanks Brian. And thanks for what you do. I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Everybody take care. We'll be talking with you soon. Thanks again.